Hey, uh, we're wrapping up our series called Welcome, and I don't know if you've been trying to integrate some hospitality into your life this summer. Um, the, the team I lead, uh, actually Trina and I are trying, trying this, and I, I forgot to do this last, last service, Ron, but uh, we got some pictures. We, had, we invited members of our team over uh, for dinner, um, so the, this team I get to lead uh, and, and their spouses, and uh, uh, the, the hers who go to same alliance they're sitting over here um molly and paul uh they do they teach cooking and so they, we invite them over to our, our house and uh, that was jeff brown's plate um and actually no that that's his and his wife plate because we were making these salad rolls and molly was teaching us how to roll them up put all the stuff in there and so we got hospitality halfway there we opened up our home had people in but then we hired someone to come cook uh, and teach us how to cook. So uh, we're, we're trying to learn how to do this and make, make room in our lives for this. And you've been, you've been sending in some great stories as well. And I'd love to read uh, a couple of them because I think stories help us understand what hospitality can look like. Because uh, it, it takes on many shapes and forms. Uh, so he, here's a story that was sent in. Uh, it says, uh, at, at ch after church a couple weeks ago, I was walking to my favorite downtown Mexican restaurant to pick up dinner when I heard a homeless man call out from on the other side of the street. He had one leg and needed help getting up back into his wheelchair. With the help of another person, we were able to get him back up and seated in his wheelchair. I quickly introduced myself and then carried on walking to go pick up my dinner for the evening. On the way back, dinner in hand, I was tempted to walk back a different way. I knew the homeless man, whose name I now knew was Harvey, would most likely ask for something to eat. Now, usually, I don't mind sharing my food with the homeless, but this was a carne asada burrito from Marcos. <laughs> Apparently very important. Uh, also, if I gave it away, it would mean I would have to figure out something else for dinner, and I was crunched for time as I was having some friends over from out of town over later that evening. And despite what felt like legitimate excuses, I sensed the Spirit prompting me to return the same way I came. As I approached Harvey, I was reminded of the sermon that evening on biblical hospitality. I felt like I was not only meant to share my burrito with Harvey, but to invite him home to share it with me. So I asked Harvey if he'd like to share a meal with me at our home, and he took me up on the offer. I then wheeled him a few blocks down the street to my house. Now, due to Harvey being in a wheelchair, we weren't able to walk up the stairs to go inside my house, so we just set up outside in my front yard. I grabbed us a couple drinks, and then we drank and ate together. And during that time, I asked Harvey questions about his life. He had been a carpenter, and he lost his leg in a car accident. I asked him what he enjoyed doing the most, and he said he really liked to work, but was not able to do that anymore. We eventually finished dinner, and I took Harvey back to where we first met. As I was wheeling him back, he asked me, why are you doing all of this? I responded by saying, if I was in your position, Harvey, I would want someone to do the same for me. In hindsight, I wish I had said something more Jesus-like about loving your neighbor as yourself, but <laughs> I think he got the sentiment. When I dropped him off, I was pleased to see that a friend of his was there who was planning on taking him to a homeless shelter that evening. I said goodbye and then walked back home. As I reflect on that evening, I'm so thankful that I paid attention to the nudge of the Spirit. It would have been so easy for me in my hunger and hurriedness to miss out on this opportunity to extend biblical hospitality to a stranger in need and experience the presence of Jesus in the process. I now find myself hoping and praying that I get more opportunities to eat another dinner with the Harveys of Salem. Isn't that a great story? Great story of hospitality uh, being expressed. Uh, here, here's another one. This one was sent in uh, actually by Anita, who's on our staff. She works over Broadway Commons, works at the information desk. Uh, Anita writes, uh, Thursday, a gentleman came to my desk in the information booth at Broadway Commons and handed a paper to me with a request for help. His English was very hard to understand. At first, I wasn't sure if I could help him at all. But after many questions to clarify what exactly he needed help with, it became clear that he wanted my help to transfer information from his resume to a job application. As he had difficulty in writing English, his penmanship was also very hard to read. I guessed that he might be used to a foreign script. 
We got the application completed. In the process, I noticed the country he was from and calling him by name, shared that I went to high school with a girl from his country and told him her name. His demeanor changed at that point, And he opened up and shared that he was a single father with three daughters and was having so many challenges getting employment that could work around the hours he needed to care for his family. He seemed encouraged that he had received some help and maybe some hope also as he went his way. Another great story of, of hospitality, uh, different form, different shape. But that last story actually is, is a great segue to where I want to go today. Because as we wrap up our series on hospitality, as we talk about welcome, and as I've been thinking about uh, how to wrap up this series, uh, it just dawned on me that but we, we cannot talk about hospitality. We can't talk about welcome and not talk about the topic of immigration. We can't talk about making space and loving, love the stranger without, without talking about uh, immigration and, the, and what's going on in our world. And immigration is a huge topic here in the U.S., but not only the U.S. It's a major conversation that's happening globally as millions of people have been uprooted from their homes for, for a variety of reasons and are fleeing, fleeing their nation or are, are being displaced in their nation and, and setting up new homes. And, and this conversation, it can be very divisive and emotions can run really high because the, the emotions are attached to it. There's a lot of fear. Uh, there, there, there's fear for, for those living in our country that are undocumented that they'll, that they'll be deported. There's fear from people who are living in this country, uh, who, who are documented, who are citizens, about who's coming into the country. Uh, there are people, there's a, these four freshman congresswomen who are they're being referred to as a squad, and they've got their uh, ideology on, on, on this whole topic of immigration in contrast to what our president's ideology is on this topic of, of immigration. There's sanctuary cities and sanctuary states and asylum, and, uh, and, and Republicans have an opinion and Democrats have an opinion. And if we're not careful, we're going to be discipled by Fox News and CNN and MSNBC or whatever news media you take that information in from because because this is such an, a, a toxic conversation we really need to start digging in and find out what God has to say about this but the fact of the matter is that me even just bringing up the topic has caused some of you in the room to kind of your heart rate your Apple watch is warning you there's a cardiac event going on uh, or you're of the age where you're reaching for your high blood pressure pills uh, and that's because this is such an explosive topic so I just want to tell you up front, as I've been working on this message, and I just want to warn you up front, look, there's likely a time as I'm, as I'm doing this talk today that, that you may be offended by what I have to say. Now, let me, let me just tell you this. I want to say this. I have worked really hard this week to make sure that I offend everyone. <laughs> so if you get offended early on in, in, this, in the talk, just, uh, just hang on because the other person's time's coming, okay? Or if you feel like, yeah, go for it, go for it. Later on, you go, oh, no. now you're getting personal, Steve. Uh, but, but, but hang in there. Uh, on this. And can I just say this? It'd be way easier to stay silent on this topic. I don't need more emails, okay? <laughs> I don't need more unsigned encouragement cards. Uh, and, and I'm fine with all that. In fact, it just works out so convenient that Trina and I are getting on a plane tomorrow and leaving the country. So this is perfect <laughs> timing to talk about this topic um, as we go to a Middle East field forum. Uh, but, but, but also, let me add this. Look, if you've been around Sam Alliance any length of time, you know this. When there are significant conversations taking place in our nation or in our city, uh, we, we, we want to be able to find out what's God's heart on these topics. What does he have to say about them? And as we do, you've probably seen me do this over the years, we come under the word. We, we are a people who we understand that we have wills, we have opinions, we have thoughts. But as Christ followers, as people who are walking in the way of Jesus, my job is to teach the way of Jesus, we must come under the way of Jesus. So if we're talking about money, then we're going to want to know what, what does God have to say about money and our use of money. If, if we want to we talk about parenting, we want to know what God's heart is. What's God to, what, what does he have to say about parenting? 
If we want to talk about sex, we want to, we want to know what, what, what does God have to say about sex? And so when it comes to the topic of immigration, we do the very same thing. We come under the word and we take our will and we surrender it to his will. That's what it means to be a follower of Christ. And so as we engage in the conversation on this topic, that's the very thing we are going to do. In fact, the Bible encourages us to do that. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. So, scriptures God breathe. We want to breathe his breath in on this topic and hear what he has to say. So, let me just dive in by saying this. I, you know, I, I grew up overseas. I, I, I moved to the U.S. I actually had dual citizenship. I, I was a citizen of, a, of the British Commonwealth. Brit, Hong Kong was a British colony uh, at the time. Came to America as a U.S. citizen. Uh, and I, I love the States. I, lo- I love America so much. I love ab- about America. And here's just one thing I just love, love, love about, about America. In fact, when I mention it, th- this is going to so resonate with you. You're going to probably cheer and uh, there's applause is going to break out in the room because this just so, this so, so tells the truth about who we are. Okay. So he- here, we, you're going to love this. Here's, here's the first thing. As Americans, we don't have to know what we are talking about to talk about it. This is a great country. Isn't it a great country? Or another way you could put it is this way. You could, we don't have to have informed opinions to inform people of our opinions. I mean, that's social media. I mean, just go on social media. I mean, it's just, we can, we have, we're passionate. We have emotions, but we may not have all the facts together. Um, but, but we can, we can come off like we do. So even as we engage in this conversation, let's just, let's just kind of get a landscape of what's happening in our world and get, and also when we talk about terms, who, who do we mean by these, what do we mean by these certain terms so that we have a base from which we can launch from? So let's just dive in here and identify some terms. First is migrants. Migrants move from country to country for any number of reasons. It may be for a better life, job opportunities, leaving famine or drought stricken land or natural disasters. You've probably heard the term migrant workers. This is exactly what's, what's, going, what's going on. Uh, immigrants. Immigrants, they've moved from one country to another and established residence. So it's a big difference from someone who's a migrant. And then we get to refugees. Refugees, these are folks who are fleeing their home due to war, racism, oppression, or religious persecution. They apply for refugee status and must be vetted prior to arriving in the U.S., The average refugee arriving in the United States has lived in a refugee camp for seven to ten years. So then that'd be very true. If you've ever uh, had a conversation with some of the refugees that are being resettled in Salem, our new neighbors, uh, that is very consistent with their experience. And then asylum seekers. Asylum seeker is a person who flees their home country, goes to a U.S. port of entry, or enters the U.S. and then applies for asylum, which means the right to international protection from war, persecution or violence that is given to refugees. So those are just four broad categories uh, of, of folks that uh, would, you, would, you would say are, 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 are moving around our world. And by the way, and, and some of those definitions and many of these stats that I'm about to give you, they're recent. They're from the, the UN, United Nations. UNHCR just put out these stats like a week and a half ago. And State Department provides some as well um, about what's happening in our world. There are 70.8 million forcibly displaced people worldwide today. This is the highest level of displacement on record. 41.3 million are internally displaced. What we mean by that is, like, take for example Syria. A war in Syria, people have been uprooted, many have fled their homeland, many have stayed in their homeland, but they've gone to another part of the country. That's what it means to be internally displaced. So we got 41.3 million that are internally displaced, 25.9 million are refugees, and 3.5 million are asylum seekers currently in our world. It's a global picture. Uh, this, this next uh, stat, 37,000 people a day. Get this. 37,000 people a day are forced to flee their homes because of conflict and persecution. It's, it's unbelievable what's happening in our world as it comes to the movement of, of people. 
Um, this next one, bring it home a little bit. 1960s, 5 million immigrants or migrants or refugees and asylum seekers lived in America. Today, there are 44 million immigrants, migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers. Uh, th this next uh, stat here set tells us that 17% of the U.S. labor force are immigrants. Um, this next uh, one, 3.2% of the U.S. population are undocumented. And 10.5% of the 44 million immigrants living in the U.S. are undocumented. Um, fiction, undocumented people are flooding into the U.S. Fact, illegal border crossings were at a 46-year low in 2017, and last year was the fifth lowest level in 46 years. Uh, another uh, fiction fact, the undocumented population doesn't pay taxes. This is part of the conversation that gets people uh, kind of emo emotive. Everyone pay, pays sales tax, unless you're in Oregon, uh, <laughs> on goods they purchase. And more than half of all the undocumented immigrant households file income tax returns using individual tax identification numbers. Um, the U.S. spends $20 billion a year on ICE and CBP. ICE is Immigration Customs Enforcement. CBP is Customs Border Patrol. That's more than the combined budgets of the FBI, the DEA, the Secret Service, and U.S. Marshals and ATF, uh, Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms uh, Bureau. ICE and CBP has a total of 50,000 agents. That's just a, a little bit of what's happening globally, how it impacts us as a nation, and some of those stats go to just show us, look, this is a huge topic, so much so that m there's a lot of dollars directed at this topic. And the emotions run high because there's talks about detention centers and are they crowded or overcrowded? I mean, and what are the, what, what's, the, what's the care given there? Are children being separated from their parents? And if so, if so I mean, which it, it, it is so, what, what, is, what is going on and, how, and how, how can that happen? And people are very, very concerned about this topic, but many people have no idea what to do. So the question that I, I want to place before us is, is simply is, what is God's heart on this topic? What, as Christ followers, people who are in the, walking the way of Jesus, what's our response to this important conversation? And so what I want to do is sort of set up for us uh, the, the sides of this, uh, the dimensions of this, this debate uh, and, and focus pretty much on, when it, on, the, on the Christian perspective of this, of this debate. And um, the, the first side of this conversation, really, uh, I'll just call it, we'll just put it over here. We'll, we'll, I'll put this, this, this placard up here, Leviticus 19, as a representation of this conversation. Because conversation, Leviticus 19, uh, it, it says this. It says, do not take advantage of foreigners... Who live among you in your land. Treat them like native born Israelites and love them as you love yourself. Remember that you were once foreigners living in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So, a little context for Levit Leviticus, because Leviticus is one of those books that some of you maybe got to chapter 2 on, your, your yearly Bible reading. You love Genesis, you loved Exodus, and you got to Leviticus and you thought, I'm out. Um, and a little context for you, okay? Because God has rescued his people from Egypt, and these people don't know their God. So Leviticus is all these commands about this. See, kind of, the, if some of you are old enough to remember the Dick and Jane books. It's kind of, the, it's a, kind of a, a primer, an ABC book. It's, I'm giving you the first steps of how you can be in relationship with me. That's what Leviticus is all about. I want you to know me. And in this conversation, what we need to know about God is this, that he has a huge heart. You can go back to that previous verse if you would, Ron. He has a huge heart for the foreigner. He says, remember, you were a foreigner. Before I rescued you from you, that's who you were. And I had compassion on you. So I want you to have compassion on the foreigner in your midst. 92 times in the Old Testament alone, there is some sort of statement about showing mercy or compassion or doing justice to the foreigner. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 27 says, Cursed is anyone who denies justice to foreigners, orphans, or widows. And all the people will reply, Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 24 says, Never take advantage of poor and destitute laborers, whether they are fellow Israelites 
or foreigners living in your towns. And the foreigners living in your towns, if you remember your de- de- definitions, these would have been migrants. D- don't take advantage of them. But if you really want to understand God's heart for those who are being uprooted from their home and they're having to flee uh, due to religious persecution or war or whatever it might be, if you really want to kind of get a feel for God's heart, then you need to read the book of Obadiah. Obadiah, one chapter. And what it does is Obadiah captures the moment in history when Babylon is conquering Jerusalem. Now, as Babylon is attacking Jerusalem, people are running for their lives. They're fleeing. They're, these are refugees. And what they do is many of them go to a neighboring country, just like people would do today. There are over a million refugees in northern Jordan today who have fled out of Syria. This would have been, I don't know about those numbers, but there would have been people fleeing from Jerusalem looking for refuge in a neighboring country, and they went to Edom. But Edom refused to show hospitality, refused to take refugees in, and listen to what God says to them. Listen to how the, 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 the in, inhospitable spirit was expressed, and then listen to what God says. Obadiah, verses 11 through 14. When they were invaded, when Jerusalem was invaded, you stood aloof, refusing to help them. Foreign invaders carried off their wealth and cast lots to divide up Jerusalem. But you acted like one of Israel's enemies. You should not have gloated when they exiled your relatives to distant lands. You should not have rejoiced when the people of Judah suffered such misfortune. You should not have spoken arrogantly in that terrible time of trouble. You should not have plundered the land of Israel when they were suffering such calamity. You should not have gloated over their destruction when they were suffering such calamity. You should not have seized their wealth when they were suffering such calamity. You should not have stood at the crossroads killing those who tried to escape. You should not have captured the survivors and handed them over in their terrible time of trouble. We'll just list these things that God calls them out on. On that day, you stood aloof, meaning that you took a passive stance. You just, you timed out. All this is going on, and you stood aloof. You were passive when all this this tragedy was going on. You gloated over your brother in the day of his misfortune. You laughed and you told jokes while they were being exiled. You actually entered Jerusalem and you looted Jerusalem in their day of disaster. You stood at the crossroads and cut down the refugees. You captured ref- refugees and traitorously handed the savior, the survivors over, uh, over, over to Babylon. Um, and, and the psalmist captures this agony that these refugees were experiencing. One, one, of the, one of the exilic psalms says, O Lord, remember what the Edomites did on the day the armies of Babylon captured Jerusalem. Destroy it, they yelled. Level it to the ground. In fact, God at the end of Obadiah will say, as you have treated your brother Israel in the day of their disaster, I will treat you. So friends, on the front end of this conversation about immigration, we need to understand God's heart. He has a massive heart for displaced people. He has so much compassion for for foreigners, aliens, sojourners. His mind, in fact, he, he would say to Israel, love them like you love yourself. Show compassion. This is who God is. And Leviticus 19 sort of stands out as sort of a, an example of all the other scriptures in the Old Testament. And, and you could go to the New Testament as well, but we don't, you know, we don't have the time to do that. But we, we, we see that this is who God is. He has his eye on the one who is a stranger in the land. But there's another side to this whole conversation. And the other side of the conversation, really, you can root it in and uh, in this text from Scripture, Romans chapter 13. In fact, not too long ago, a previous U.S. Attorney General stood in the White House and opened a Bible and read from Romans chapter 13 as he began speaking about the topic of immigration. And this is what Romans chapter 13 has to say, and it represents the other side of this argument. It says, Everyone must submit to governing authorities, for all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. 
So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and they will be punished. For the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right, but in those who are doing wrong. Would you like to live without fear of the authorities? Do what is right, and they will honor you. The authorities are God's servants, sent for your good. But if you are doing wrong, of course you should be afraid, for they have the power to punish you. They are God's servants, sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. So you must submit to them, not only to avoid punishment, but also to keep a clear conscience. Pay your taxes, too, for these same reasons. For government workers need to be paid. Any state workers in the room who would say amen to that? They are, they are serving God in what they do. Give to everyone what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them and give respect and honor to those who are in authority. Friends, in this conversation, we've got a, a pretty big chunk of scripture and, and I could go to First Peter and I could read more on this one that, you know what, that, that there are laws and, and, and God has instituted authority. In fact, what Romans 13 tells us that if you disregard, if you disrespect the laws of a land, you're not just rebelling against the government, you're rebelling against God. That's what Romans 13 says. And it doesn't, it doesn't end there. The conversation doesn't end there because you get to Acts chapter 17 and, and you, read, uh, you read this. Oh, yeah, thanks, Ron. Forgot this one. We'll get to Acts 17. Deuteronomy 31. Moses is talking to the assembly of, of, uh, just before he passes away. And he says, you must read this book of instruction to all the people of Israel when they assemble before the Lord your God at the place he chooses. Call them all together. Now, look, look who he's calling together. Men. Women, children, and the foreigners living in your towns, so they may hear this book of instruction and learn to fear the Lord your God and carefully obey all the terms of these instructions. The law is going to be read, and what Moses wants is clarity. In order for there to be clarity on what the law, the religious laws, the moral laws, the civil laws, the ceremonial laws, and, 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 there needs to be clarity. And so get the men and the women, the boys and the girls, and the foreigners. Because everyone needs to align themselves with the law of God. Then, Acts 17, verse 26, we get this. From one man, God created all the nations throughout the earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. This is really important. You see, if you're, uh, if you're over here and you're, you're kind of this, hey, there's laws, we've got to obey laws. One thing what you'll also say is, and guess what? Borders were God's idea. He actually set the borders for nations. I mean, when the 12 tribes of Israel, he was the one who had the idea of 12 tribes. He was the one who set the borders in for the 12 tribes. And they had been ordained by God. And borders need to be respected. And in fact, some who, who would say, from this angle, they would say, look, look at Ezra and Nehemiah. They had to get paperwork before they would travel to another nation. And, and this, this side of, of, of the argument is, is important to understand because it represents the structure that God has put in place, the government, and we're called to obey the government. Yet on this side, there's so much saying that God's heart for the immigrant, for the refugee, for the asylum seeker, for the migrant worker, that God's heart, God's heart is huge for them. And, and so can you, can you feel the tension between both sides of this? There's tension there, and, um, and so what do we do that? I mean, what do we do? I'm not telling you. <laughs> I will tell you this. We need wisdom, and we need maturity to move forward and to walk this pathway because it feels like there are good points made on both sides of this debate. But let me say this. What do John Bunyan, Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, Corey Ten Boom and her family, and I could list other names, what do they all have in common? Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, Bunyan uh, was, was told that he could not preach in the public square because he didn't have a license, and they wouldn't give him a license. But he preached anyways, and he was thrown in prison. Rosa Parks, this moment that seems to have ignited the, the civil rights movement, Rosa Parks was seated on a bus 
and was told that she should move and make room for someone who was Caucasian, white. And she refused to move. She was a Christ follower. Martin Luther King, who started and, and, and led the civil rights movement, um, many times in peaceful marches defied orders to cease and desist. He, he paid for that movement with his life. I, I mean, I, I, we, we could go on. In each in the Ten Boom family, they hid Jews in their home. You know, the, the, the famous book, The Hiding Place. They hid Jews in their home, even though the law of the land was that all Jews should be deported to either death camps or work camps. In each and every case, they violated laws, they broke laws in what, in what they did. And there are heroes. Oh, you could go into scripture. You could talk about the Hebrew midwives in the book of Exodus who were told by Pharaoh that if there's the, any Hebrew baby that's born, the little girls, they can live. But any little Hebrew baby boy needed to be put to death. And they defied that edict from Pharaoh. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what we studied in the book of Daniel in the fall, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were government workers, and they were told to go to this plain. An idol was, was, was there, and when the music played, everyone was ordered to bow down at, at, the, at the expense. It would be a death penalty if you didn't. And they refused to bow, bow, bow down. They, they broke the law. Daniel, uh, there was an edict of, of this, the law of the Medes and Persians was given about there's no prayer that should happen unless it's to Darius, uh, the, the, you know, the leader of the day. And Daniel opens the shutters and faces Jerusalem and continues to pray. And he's thrown into the lion's den. Uh, there's these, uh, Jer- I mean, Jeremiah is told to stop prophesying these negative things about Jerusalem, and he's, he's thrown into a cistern. Uh, there's these couple of unschooled uh, disciples that are told to stop talking about Jesus, and their response is, we must obey God rather than man. And then there's this guy named Jesus, who seemed to consistently break the laws of the Sabbath as he healed the sick and as he freed the demonized. Friends, what What's common in all these? These are our heroes. These are our biblical heroes, and these are history's heroes. And why is that the case? And I think a principle emerges from these stories as we have this conversation about immigration. And the principle is this. So put it, put it up here. Uh, on, go to the next one there, Ron, if you would. Uh, the principle is this. When the law of the land is at odds with Scripture... The commands of God take priority. Friends, this is why when it comes to the topic even of of abortion, of of taking the life of an unborn child, those who believe in the sanctity of life get get outraged at the fact that this is happening and want laws to change. And that is because there's this law, and it's in conflict with God's command. And what we discover and what we learn from the heroes of our faith and even the heroes of history is that when the laws of the land come into conflict with the laws of God, the laws of God always take priority. Yet, now, Augustine said this, one of the early church fathers, Augustine said, an unjust law is no law, which, if you're not careful, can then produce anarchy. So Thomas Aquinas comes along and says something like this. Aquinas says, The disobedience of unjust laws should only take place if the disobedience is less evil than the unjust law itself. Made total sense to you, I can tell. You you guys are right with me. Here's what Aquinas is saying. Aquinas is saying, look, if you see a law that's in conflict with the law of God, you cannot violate the will of God to accomplish the will of God. You cannot create evil to conquer evil. So, for example, 2009, May 31, there's an abortion doctor who's working in a clinic, and a Christian walks into the clinic and shoots him, murders him. And people are, like, confused. And because evil has been done to stop evil. Now, just mentioning that gets people's heads spinning, but yeah, but this, is, this evil's worse than that evil, and I, we can go on that conversation all day long, uh, but I'm getting on a plane tomorrow. But <laughs> the point is this. On this topic of immigration, we have the heart of God and the commands of God. And we live in a land that has laws. 
and there's conflict. And so what we need is wisdom in knowing how to move forward into the future, how to have this conversation without demonizing people or dehumanizing people, and seek justice. Now, a couple things as we wrap up. First thing I want to say this. Whatever we do to move forward, and however you feel conviction, here's the thing in this whole series, hospitality must characterize our attitude toward immigration. Wherever you, whatever conviction you come to on this topic, whatever you, 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 love of the stranger, just as you love a best friend or you love your family, that's the kind of love God asks us to express towards a stranger. So when it comes to the foreigner among us, we should love them like we love ourselves. That's the command of God. Second thing I would say is this. Avoid the worship of nationhood. See the nations as your extended family. Friends, when nationhood is worship, I'm not saying it's wrong to be patriotic. I'm not saying it's bad to love your country. We need to love our country. We need to pray for our president. We need to pray for government officials. We need to pray for our governor, our state legislature. We need to pray for those among us who are serving in government. It's, it's a good thing to love your country. But avoid the worship of nationhood because, friends, if you go back to World War II, this is what got the German church in trouble. They confused their patriotism, their loyalty to nation, to a nation, and what happened is it started moving along at such a pace that it actually compromised their loyalty to God. And when they realized it, it was too late. Avoid the worship of nationhood. If you ever get to a point where you feel like you're superior to another race, then we got a problem. That's called racism, ethnocentrism. And so what we need to do is see the nations as extended family. And as we do, that will form and shape our attitudes towards those among us. Now, I've said a lot. Let's just bow our heads, close our eyes, and let's ask the Spirit of God then to speak to us. And Spirit, you have been speaking. And Jesus, we ask you today, Jesus, what what do you want us to know about you today? What's something you're revealing about who you are to us? And in light of this, what are you asking of us today? How are you asking us to respond? How are you asking us to align ourselves with your will today? Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening.